Hello everybody, so we've got a uh, rainy day out here at the sawmill and I thought this would be a good opportunity to make a new video to talk about sawmill blade tension. Now those of you that follow uh, Woodland Mills uh, probably know that they just released a bulletin within the last month or so to talk about different ways to uh, set blade tension. There's been a lot of discussion about this on their uh, Facebook group and um, there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of misunderstandings about what's actually happening when we set blade tension. Um, and I thought it would be great to go uh, into depth and talk about uh, how blade tension works. Um, now, as you, if you know my videos, most of my videos are focused on practical know-how, you know, problem solving, uh, uh, information I've, uh, uh, and, and stuff I've learned over the years from experience and just living out in the country. Today I'm going to draw more on my background as a mechanical engineer. I have three degrees in mechanical engineering. Uh, I've taught at the university level and the only reason I mention this is that there's a lot of information out on YouTube and when you're talking about sawmills, uh, machinery, and in particular, uh, uh, you know, the, the type of machinery that could hurt you if, if things are not done uh, correctly, I think there needs to be some credibility associated with the videos and so I just wanted to throw out there that I, I am qualified to talk about this stuff um, and hopefully that's going to help us explain things and understand things in a simple way and, and we'll definitely draw it back to practical know-how and understanding and really how to, to operate and get the most out of your sawmill and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to do this video in a couple different parts and then knit them together. Um, We'll start by looking over that bulletin from Woodland Mills and talk about the two methods they are recommending to uh, set blade tension. Uh, by the way, both of those methods have pros and cons. They could both be great, they could both be terrible. So it's not like one is, is better than the other. Uh, I know a lot of people who use a torque wrench to set their tension think that's better. A lot of people who uh, will uh, use the position of this uh, thrust uh, bushing, I think that's a better method. Well, you know, the, the reality is both of those methods uh, have pros and cons, and both of those methods are indirect. Okay, and so we're going to talk about really how those methods work, how the Woodland Mills tensioner setup works, and then kind of drive towards our ultimate goal, which is to set the tension in our blade, in our band, and that's really what matters. It, only, it doesn't so much matter how you get there, what matters is what the tension is in that uh, that band blade um, once you've got it set. And at the end, we're going to come back and we're going to kind of run a little bit of a lab experiment here. We're going to try and measure uh, that blade tension by attempting to measure the strain in the blade with a fairly simple setup uh, using uh, uh, some clamps and a dial indicator and see how close that gets us to what we know the tension should be based on those other methods. So um, stay tuned, we'll start putting these pieces together and, uh, and start talking about this in more detail. Okay, I wanted to start out here at the mill where we can kind of point to things and sort of set the stage. And after this, we're gonna go inside and look at some drawings and get into the guts of the, the system. But, uh, you know, the basic gist of the, of the tensioning setup is, you know, we've got our follower wheel here, we've got the band going around it. And if we want to introduce tension into that band, we really just need to pull the follower wheel in that direction, okay? We need to pull it that way. That's going to stretch the uh, band, and it's going to introduce tension uh, into that band. Now, in the middle of this follower wheel, we've got a hub. It's got some bearings, and there's basically a shaft, kind of an axle shaft, um, that pokes out through the, the back of the mill. we will come around back here. And this is the housing that that holds the back of that uh, axle shaft for the follower wheel and the way we're going to move that wheel and introduce tension is just to simply move this housing that way the way that's done is there's a, um, a yoke attached to this housing with a threaded rod that threaded rod has a coarse trapezoid thread uh, an industry slang for that is an acme thread you, you see them used a lot in jacks uh, and other positioning types of systems. And that rod comes through here and it goes into our handle. That handle is drilled out in the middle and tapped to accept those threads. 
And so as I begin to turn this handle, it's going to draw in that Acme screw and pull this this way. And you can see as I'm tightening up the handle, it's, it's drawing uh, this whole yoke and this housing uh, this way. It's moving the wheel and it's going to introduce tension into the band. And uh, really, this is, this is not complicated. This is really a simple jack screw like you'd see in all kinds of other situations. It happens to be horizontal and uh, moving things horizontally, but this is very typical jack screw setup you'd see in a whole uh, variety of, of uses. And so um, at this point, let's go inside and look at some uh, drawings and, and look at the guts of the inside of this whole mechanism to uh, kind of further explain what we just talked about here. Okay, so we're back inside here on uh, my computer and I've pulled up uh, the parts diagram for the HM122 mill. Uh, this, this is in the back of the mill owner's manual or you can get these online at the Woodland Mills uh, website. And of course they've got uh, different manuals for the other model mills that'll also have parts diagrams in them. Uh, but this shows a kind of an exploded view of the tensioner assembly that we just talked about out at the mill. And um, down here, when I'm circling, hopefully you'll see that, that's that threaded rod with a yoke on it that I talked about. And you can see that yoke is gonna engage this uh, housing, which actually holds that axle shaft that we talked about where the follow wheel, wheel uh, mounts. And then this is the uh, stub that we looked at the uh, the back of uh, on the, the other, other side of the mill. And so you can see how this kind of uh, goes together and forms kind of a cartridge. This yoke attaches into that cartridge. And then we've got this uh, threaded rod over here that engages uh, through another little housing into our tensioner handle uh, over here. Okay, and so that's kind of the uh, exploded view of, of what we kind of uh, just talked about out at the mill looking at the outside. Here's the inside. Um, and uh, one thing before I forget, if you go back and you look at the parts list for the mill, that tension rod um, that's listed here, and they spec that as a trapezoid 18 by 3 thread. That's a metric uh, trapezoid thread. It's, it's similar to an Acme thread, which would be um, um, have English dimensions to it. Uh, the metric trapezoid thread has a slight, light, slightly different angle to the thread pitch, but other than that, it's this, the same concept. And so uh, we'll come back to that later. Remember that trapezoid 18 by 3 um, uh, thread. Um, but uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about uh, over here <clears throat> is in the middle of this tensioner setup, um, straddling this threaded rod is a stack of Belleville washers. And these are, these are really known as a disc spring. Um, it's a coned washer that um, is usually heat treated or, or uh, treated in a way to, that gives it a springy property. And uh, these Belleville washers are often uh, stacked up like you see in this image here. Uh, oftentimes around a shaft or inside some sort of a tube. And this is a really inexpensive way to uh, assemble a spring mechanism. It's also something you can quickly adjust by taking out or adding uh, more of these, these Belleville disc washers in your assembly. And so <clears throat> this is a real uh, simple and repeatable and I would say calibratable way to uh, build up a a spring and that's what Woodland Mills has done in here. They have put a spring in between the tightening action of this handle and the threaded rod uh, that that handle tightens up against. And this has a couple purposes. Uh, so first of all, this isn't necessary, okay? Um, they don't need to put these springs in there. If we just had a way to draw up and tighten up this rod so that it moves uh, to the lower right here in the picture, then it's gonna pull this axle shaft and it's gonna pull the follower wheel and it's gonna tension the blade and we'll, we'll get an intended result out of that. 
Um, and in fact, if we could always count on the fact that blades were made exactly the same and they were exactly the same length, you could simply put a mark with a ruler and say, hey, if I move this threaded rod when I tighten things up, if I move it out, let's say, you know, three quarters of an inch or something, you would know that you'd be getting the same tension every time. But blades are never exactly the same length. The material properties might vary a little bit from blade to blade. And so we can't do something that simple for this sawmill. I have seen that type of system used on shop band saws um, where you just pull your tension over by a certain amount and you're done. That, that's all uh, you do. But it's really not practical for a sawmill, especially one that's going to be outdoors and you know could be operated in the winter, heat of summer, big temperature swings. So what they've done is they've put this stack of uh, these Belleville disc washers in here, these springs, to kind of uh, allow us to compensate for all these other possibilities we could encounter. And so when we're tightening up this tensioning handle, what we're really doing is we're compressing this spring stack here that in turn is going to apply a force uh, uh, that's going to draw our tensioner rod uh, that way. But now our, our tightening mechanism, it gives us kind of an indirect force that goes through this stack of springs. And basically what we're doing when we're tightening up the handle now is directly what we're doing is we're compressing this stack of springs. We're putting a load into that stack of springs. That stack of springs is then going to transfer the load to our tensioner handle. It's going to pull against the uh, follower wheel and it's going to give us a blade tension. And it's going to do it in a way that's going to be more repeatable for a range of conditions. You know, if you got a slightly longer blade, okay, you'll just maybe turn this a little bit more. But in the end, you're going to load up these springs and you're going to pull against this shaft in the same way. And you're going to introduce the same tension. And so that's really one of the first points of these springs. Um, and if you know anything about springs with a spring, the force developed by the spring is always going to be linearly proportional to the amount you compress that spring or stretch it if it's a tension spring. But in this case, uh, when we compress this spring stack by a certain amount, it's always going to generate really the same amount of force in a very repeatable and predictable way. And so this is an attempt to give us a nice, repeatable, predictable way to uh, set tension on the mill and if we could measure the displacement of the spring stack then that's going to be a very good indicator of the force it develops and the tension it's going to apply into this uh, system and so you know some of the um, uh, mills I think 2020 and maybe some earlier models uh, they put this thrust washer or thrust bushing here and you can eyeball the amount that this uh, goes into this housing here and that will give you an indication of your uh, load in the spring and then indirectly the tension you're putting um, into this tensioning rig and then onto the blade and so uh, that's that's the first point of those springs the second purpose is to provide a little bit of cushioning um, so you know the, these mills vibrate a lot uh, the blade takes loads from the wood, from hitting knots. Um, all kinds of things can happen that could really tug against your uh, tensioning mechanism. And if it was rigid, if it was fixed hard, that's going to put stresses on the blade. It's going to lead to quality issues in the wood. It's going to have a lot of undesirable effects. And so by having the this spring stack in here it's going to act as a cushion almost almost like a shock absorber in a sense um, not any damping but it's going to have a cushioning effect it's going to be able to absorb different shocks and different loads that transmit through the blade into this tensioning system and allow it to keep a positive tension um, on the blade and and just just have a little bit of give to to, to accommodate uh, different types of motion so now in my experience, I've had my mill, um, I guess about uh, 10, 10 months now, going almost, almost 11 months. Um, I've always set my tension by cranking this in so that the thrust washer is flush with the housing as, as their instructions called for in 2020. And it's always worked great for me. Uh, 
you know, all this time I've never thrown a single blade. I've never had any other issues you could attribute to improper tensioning. So um, all I can tell you is this system has worked really, really good for me. But I think starting in 2021, uh, a lot of people began having problems with this system. Um, and it became clear that they were not getting a good tensioning just by looking at the position of this bushing in the housing. And I think some people, you know, took took their their tension apart and found that, you know, they didn't have a, uh, the, the right number of Belleville disc springs or they were not installed correctly. Uh, over here in their image, you see that they they are alternated generally. You can actually really fine tune how these behave by alternating some, stacking others. And so there's different ways to do it. But Woodland Mills calls out a particular way that they want these stacked. And some people found that that wasn't right. Um, other people found that, well, it was assembled right, but I'm just not getting uh, correct tension. I'm not getting repeatable results. And so, you know, when I started hearing things like that, I start to think of manufacturing, uh, quality control, um, maybe the Belleville um, disc spring, uh, the supplier was not giving them um, consistent uh, springs. You know, maybe there were um, issues in the metallurgy or the, the heat treatment or who knows what, uh, especially with these parts coming from offshore from different suppliers. Sometimes you just cannot count on repeatable quality for little teeny components like this. I mean, this is, you know, this is a needle in a haystack when you look at the thousands of parts in your mill. And it just became apparent to me that this was no longer a repeatable method. And so that has led to Woodland Mills putting out this bulletin. Um, we'll go back up here. Uh, this came out in July, I believe, um, where they talk about how things work. And so here's our handle. Here's our thrust bearing. Here's that stack of Belleville disc springs. They have some shim washers in here, which are meant to fine tune it. And then this would be the tensioning shaft. And they talk about, you know, how tension is important, the pros and cons of too low tension, too high tension, what you get with your recommended tension. And this is all good information. You know, when you tension properly, it, the mill is going to track properly. It's going to cut accurately. You're going to get good life out of your bearings and your belts. Um, and so it's important. It's also much safer. And then in this bulletin, they go and they talk about a couple different tensioning methods. And I'm going to start with the last one first because I just talked about it. This is the flush bearing method, um, which has worked great for me. Again, you know, I've, I've had this mill for 10 going on 11 months. I've never had issues. I've always used this method. Just just eyeballing this so that it's flush. I've always had great success with this. But you know what? If these washers aren't installed right, if they weren't manufactured right, if they're not giving you repeatable uh, compression properties in this spring stack, then this method is not going to give you the intended results. This, this bushing could end up being flush for tension that is way too low or tension that is way too high. And so I think they've since backtracked on using this method because they realize it's not repeatable like it uh, is intended. It should be. It should be super repeatable, but it's not. So they're calling this method three now, and they're saying you can also use this, but you need to calibrate it against uh, the methods one or two. So we'll go back up to those. Method one is to use a torque wrench. And so you're going to set, you know, hook your torque wrench up to the handle. Some models have a bolt head. Other methods have a little uh, square um, notch in there that your wrench will fit into. And you're going to apply 20 to 25 foot pounds uh, against that tensioner handle to tighten it up. And they're saying that is the recommended uh, tension range. And we're going to come back and revisit this uh, in a second to talk about how torque can translate into tension because torque is a rotational load. It's basically a leverage load uh, applied rotationally or torsionally. It's not the same as tension. It's not the same as force. Um, and that's one of the first misconceptions I've seen with a lot of people running these mills is 
you know, they say, I'm tensioning my blade to 25 foot pounds. Well, no, you're not. You're turning your tensioner and tightening and snugging it up to 25 foot pounds, but that's introducing an entirely different type of load and an entirely different type of tension onto your tensioner and your blades. And so we'll come back and revisit, revisit this in a second to talk about how torque does translate into tension. But short takeaway now is it's not the same. It, this is an indirect uh, measure of tension. Method number two that they're talking about is to count your turns. And basically you would spin this handle until you can feel all the slack taken out of the blade and then give it two and a half to three turns. Uh, and that's going to put the uh, blade tension within the recommended range. Um, and this is, uh, I would call this, to me, this is probably the most reliable method. This is the, the dumb, low-tech, keep it simple and stupid method. Because when you count the number of turns on this handle, you're really uh, counting how much of that threaded rod you are taking up inside the handle. And you're basically applying a known amount of movement and motion to that tensioning rig and you're pulling the blade over by that certain amount. And like I mentioned earlier, this wouldn't work uh, without the springs. You need the springs in there to take up some cushioning to, to um, uh, provide relief and to give you kind of a repeatable um, translation between this amount of take up in your handle and the amount that gets translated over to the tensioner. So this is kind of important to have the springs in there doing something. Um, but that's method number two. And uh, what I want to do now is I'm going to switch over to uh, uh, paper and, and pen. And we'll talk first about how torque can translate into tension, show how it's indirect, it's not perfect. Um, none of these other methods are perfect either. I think this is the simplest if you can get it to work. Um, but we'll, we'll go into some simple theory about uh, the, the torque wrench uh, method uh, first and um, uh, talk about that in more detail. Okay, so we want to start off by talking about the relationship between the torque that you put into a uh, jack screw or threaded rod that you're turning and the force that you get out of it, the force that's generated. And it turns out this relationship is real simple. All it's gonna really depend upon is the pitch of those threads, which I'm gonna denote P. And uh, earlier, you remember, we looked at the um, parts list for woodland mills and saw that the, uh, the um, tensioning shaft threads uh, were quoted as trapezoid 18 by three. That's um, basically a metric Acme style thread. And this is what those threads would look like. They'll have a pitch of three millimeters and then a, a diameter of 18 millimeters. Um, interesting that metric trapezoid threads have a 30 degree angle here within the threads. A true Acme uh, English thread is gonna be 29 degrees, but otherwise they're very similar. And so, um, uh, just the number to remember here is our pitch three millimeters that uh, works out to 0 0.1181 inches or 0 0.0098425 feet, which we'll be using later on. Okay, so back to this, we want to determine the relationship to, to figure out when we put a torque in, how much force we're going to get out. And uh, you can look up a formula for this in a cookbook, um, but I find it's more instructive to really get down to the basics and understand where that formula comes from. And so what I want you to think about is if we make one full revolution of this uh, jack screw, what happens? Okay. Well, if we make one full revolution, first of all, we're going to be turning around by one circumference of that shaft. And we'll call that circumference 2 pi r, where r is the radius of that shaft. And then that shaft is going to move. If we do one revolution, we know it's going to move uh, by the pitch P. It's basically going to spin through one full thread revolution, okay? And so I kind of uh, illustrated that here. If we look at the helix of a thread and we kind of unwrap it, uh, if we go through one full turn of that, we will have turned uh, that 
in that direction the circumference 2 pi r and then we will have moved from the start of the thread to the end of the thread a distance p and one way you can think about this is if you were climbing up this thread okay you've climbed up it you've gone around a distance 2 pi r and you've gone up a distance p well that's really just a triangle if i if i unwrap it it's a triangle uh, or a wedge and we know a wedge is you know one of the simplest machines known to man uh, and a wedge is similar to an inclined plane when you start looking into the theory. But the idea of the wedge is uh, um, it gives you a mechanical advantage. And I've kind of shown that here. If we were to push on this wedge, um, it's going to basically multiply our effect. If we were to push on the wedge in that direction with a force in, we're going to get a force out that's multiplied uh, by the ratio of those two sides of the wedge and that's shown over here so the mechanical advantage is the force out over the force in that's equal to this distance over that distance so 2 pi over p and remember that comes back from our circle from the shaft okay and if we come down to here um, i'm going to set this formula to say okay my output force is a function of my input force times 2 pi, o, 2 pi r over p. And if I do a force times the radius of that shaft, that's a leverage, that's actually a torque, okay? So I've grouped these guys here, force in and the radius, and I'm gonna replace that with torque in. And what we end up with is that the force we get out of this shaft when we turn it is 2 pi over p, P is the thread pitch times the input torque. Okay, so that's that gives us a uh, equation a relationship between uh, the torque that we put into this shaft when we turn it and the force that we can get out of it um, by having it move and creating a wedge effect with those threads. And this is basically how any screw jack or um, even a scissor jack that has a screw in the middle that you know um, uh, raises a uh, mechanism of, of, of levers and linkages, they're all working on this principle. You put a torque in and you're going to get a force out. And so that's our formula. And, and this will explain how, you know, Woodland and Mills can say, hey, torque, torque your uh, tension um, uh, handle to 20 to 25 foot pounds. That's going to be this number. And based on the pitch of that screw inside the tensioner, that's going to generate a certain force out. Okay, so um, um, I should mention one other thing before I go on. This was an ideal relationship. This assumes that whatever I put in, I get something out with no losses. Well, we know there's friction on these threads. Um, even when they're they're greased up, there's going to be friction and. You would not believe this, but you will actually lose 80 to 90% of your input torque to friction, uh, even uh, even with a well-lubricated uh, um, jack screw. I mean, that's hard to believe, but that's, that's what happens. And so in practice, what we'll do is we'll put a efficiency factor in here that we can use to multiply our input torque and the pitch uh, relationship here to adjust what we get out. And uh, we'll call that eta, Greek letter eta, that's usually used for efficiency. And values of 0.1 to 0.2 are typically what we'll use for a lubricated jack screw, okay? So we're gonna carry forward with this formula. And what I've done here is I've come and I've computed um, some values of the output force versus the input torque for both 20 foot pound and 25 foot pound inputs, and then for these different efficiencies, 0.1 up to 0.2. And what that's telling us is that when we're putting in uh, 20 foot pound, we're gonna be generating a pulling force on our follower wheel anywhere from uh, 1,277 pounds on up to 2,553 pounds, depending on the efficiency factor we choose. If we're using 25 foot pounds, it's gonna range from 1,596 pounds up to 3192 pounds. And so we're only putting in, you know, 
20 to 25 foot pounds of torque, but because we get a mechanical advantage of that screw, and even with friction losses, you know, we're generating, you know, one to 3,000 pounds of, uh, of force out of that. And, uh, you know, that's, that's quite a bit of force to think about. Um, uh, but again, you know, uh, some people talk about tensioning their blade to 25 foot pounds. Well, no, you're, you're, you're putting a torque into that shaft, uh, into that jack screw. It's using mechanical advantage to turn that into a force. And these are the force values. This is the range of force values we can expect to be getting out of that uh, tensioning adjustment, depending on, you know, how well lubricated it is and what torque uh, you're using. Okay, so we move on now. Now, what we just computed, if, if you consider this to be your follower wheel on the saw, we just computed this force that the tensioner mechanism is pulling the wheel with. Okay, well, because the band blade wraps around it, the tension in that band blade is pulling opposites, pulling back against our, our tensioner in two places. Okay, so we, we would call this a statics analysis or, a, a, you know, engineering mechanics. You look at this and you think, okay, well, uh, you know, when I tension it up, the wheel's not moving, which means these forces all have to be balancing out, which means um, the two blade tension forces, which I call B here, are going to add up and equal that single um, tension mechanism force we're putting into it, uh, F. And so we say F is 2B, or the tension force in the blade is going to be half of whatever our force in the tensioner is. And so here's a um, similar table, and all I've done is divide uh, F from the previous table by two to get B. And what that tells us is, depending on which friction or efficiency you're assuming in your jack screw and which torque value you're putting in, you're basically creating anywhere from about 600 to about 1600 pounds of tension uh, within that band. And um, that's really the number that actually matters um, in that band. So from here, I wanna move on and talk about uh, tensile stress in the blade. Okay, so we've calculated the blade uh, tension force here in pounds, but uh, if you look at the specs for uh, most um, bandsaw blades, they talk more about a tensile stress uh, in PSI. And so we wanna go forward and calculate that next. Uh, up to this point, the calculations that I've gone through are applicable to any of the recent uh, Woodland Mills models because they're all using that uh, TR 18 by three thread on the tension screw. So they're all gonna have the same relationship between the input torque and the output force. But uh, starting here, I'm gonna get specific down to the HM122 because that's what I have. Uh, because this blade stress is gonna be dependent on the size of the blade. So the HM122, I'm running uh, one and a quarter by 42 thousandths inch thick uh, blades. And if you take a look at those blades, the one and a quarter dimension runs to the outside of the tooth, uh, but uh, the stress is gonna really depend on the narrow part of the blade. And, and if, so if you go down in the gullet here and measure, it's right almost exactly at one inch. So if we wanna calculate the cross-sectional area uh, of these blades, we've got one inch by 0.042 inches, and that gives us 0.042 square inches uh, for the cross-sectional area. And so to, to go from our um, blade tensile force values, which we call B, to a tensile stress, which we're gonna call sigma, Greek letter sigma for stress, um, we really just take that tensile force B, which is in pounds, we're gonna divide it by the blade cross-sectional area in square inches, and we're gonna end up with the units of PSI, and it's as simple as that, okay? So over here on this last page, what I've done is I've, again, carried forward the previous table uh, before we had it in the blade tension force B in pounds. Now I've calculated it uh, into a stress in PSI, and again, we've got 20 and 25 foot-pounds of torque up top, and then our uh, 
jack screw efficiencies ranging anywhere from 0.1 to 0.2 going down this way. And so if you go look through this table, you can see, you know, based on this matrix of values, we're going to generate anywhere from uh, 15,000 PSI of tensile stress in the blade uh, all the way up to 38,000 uh, PSI tensile stress uh, in the blade. Uh, now, if you look at uh, Lennox blades, they recommend kind of a sweet spot for blade tension of uh, between 25 and 30,000 PSI. Uh, in fact, they say don't run the blades uh, above 35,000 PSI. Um, and so, you know, based on that, I think I think we can kind of eliminate this bottom row uh, in the table and, and focus on these two. And uh, when I've reached out to a couple of sawmill companies and they're generally recommending uh, blade tensile stress in the 15,000 to 20,000 range. And uh, in fact, uh, Cook Sawmill in particular, they, they shoot right for 17,500 uh, PSI, uh, which would really put us, you know, in the top uh, row of this table, you know, for these torque values for woodland mills, you know, we're, we're basically shooting into the 15 to 20,000 range, maybe, uh, you know, can overlap down in here, but uh, that's generally what we're probably looking at for, for woodland mills. Um, I'm going to give a link down below to a video from Cook Sawmills where um, uh, the owner talks more about um, blade tensile stress and uh, how they want you to set it for their mills. And it's actually really good video. He makes a really good point uh, in that he wants you to shoot for the lowest stress possible that still gives you the saw performance and the cut quality that you're after. The reason being is that um, the lower stress you have in your blade, the longer the blade's gonna last, the more sharp rings you're gonna get out of it. Uh, it's gonna run better, it's gonna put less stress on your wheels, your bearings, and you know all the other parts of the sawmill. So uh, he makes a real good point in that video about airing uh, low, uh, as low as you think you can go and still get the performance out of your mill that that you want to get and, and that's that's really really good advice and so uh, anyways you know so we, we started this exercise you know really the main point was you know what's the relationship between our input torque and the output tension and we've we've worked that down all the way now to uh, the stress in the blade um, that's that's quite an interesting progression to take. Uh, this is really all very basic engineering mechanics though, so I hope it's been um, easy to follow on. The next thing I wanna do uh, when it stops raining is to go out to my mill and we're gonna set up a real simple experiment where we're gonna attempt to measure uh, the stress in the blade based on how I set my mill and see what the actual number is. And that'll kind of be a good um, proof of, uh, you know, how good this theory's worked out, how, how relevant these numbers are. And also, you know, it'd be good guidance for me to know. I mean, I've been sawing for 10 and, 11, 10 and 11 months without any problems on my mill just by setting uh, the, uh, the tensioner handle in a certain position. Well, where, where was I actually in terms of blade tension and tensile stress in the blade um, in terms of the real world uh, engineering mechanics? So that'll be interesting to see. I'm going to break that into a separate video just because we're getting kind of long here. So look for that in part two. Um, in the meantime, thanks for watching.